are some steps that we can take as Americans to uh, dilute and eventually get rid of cancel culture? That's a great question. I mean, honestly, you know, talking across lines of difference makes a big difference. Going in with, you know, a sense of most people in their heart of hearts think they're doing the right thing and they mean well. You know, I mean, a lot of, uh, I, I, I'm not religious myself, but I was raised Catholic. And I think a lot of sort of, you know, Christian ideas of, you know, grace, mercy, compassion, all of these things, I think they, they make a huge difference. But as far as what's going on in a lot of these universities, they have to stop putting up with it. I mean, like, like, the, like the fact that if you're, and a lot of these cases we're talking about with deplatforming, they're actual violence. Like there are people like showing up and like, like um, it, this happened at Berkeley. Like they, they, they rushed an ID, the, there, was, there was some of the Israeli Defense Force who was supposed to be giving a speech. And they rushed where he was supposed to speak saying, you know, shut it down. They had to evacuate because they were smashing windows and coming like at the speaker. That's criminal, and to, to my knowledge, none of these students have even been punished. So like, one thing you have to do is stop, you have to punish the people who engage in violence. They should be expelled. Um, there, there's, no, there's no similarity, like basically kind of like words, like violence is the antithesis of freedom of speech. So I think that you have to actually enforce your rules. I think you have to stand by your speakers. And I think you should have programs where people take seriously the likelihood they, they might be wrong. And you actually have people, I, I, I think a, good, a really good exercise is, f to, is to have debates in which your job is to take the opposite point of view of what you actually think. Because I think when people do that, it's very hard to leave thinking that everyone who disagrees with you is either stupid or evil. But unfortunately, I feel like we're in a situation right now where we're highly polarized and people think, well, those other people, they're stupid and evil. So I think there's lots of things you can do but, um, it, in order to address it both on, on and off campus. But it starts with you know, showing some charity uh, and, and talking to people who you, who you might disagree with. Mm -hmm. Sure. To kind of piggyback on what the person said. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding cancel culture. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's beneficial to um, to campuses. I think that when it comes to opinion, I think that if you have an opinion and the only reason you're not sharing it is because someone's gonna get you kicked out of your job, doesn't mean that you any less have that opinion. And so I feel like what we're doing right now is this incredibly naive idea that if you think something I hate, I'd rather not know. Why? Because it makes my tummy hurt. And that's one of those things where it's kind of like, no, colleges are about knowledge. They're about knowing the world as it is. And that includes, like I always give this example. People are like, well, what about, what if, what if someone believes a conspiracy theory? What if they believe something that isn't true? And I always point out, it's like, listen, um, lizard people who live under the Denver airport do not in fact control the world. <laughs> But knowing that your girlfriend or your uncle or you, you know, your in-laws think that lizard people who live under the Denver airport control the world is really important information to have. <laughs> so even though it's completely false, we all believe false things. We all believe things that simply are not true. But if you want to understand the world as it is, you've got to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. And right now, we are wondering, like, why doesn't anyone trust each other? Well, because people, people, the cancel culture is about, like, you, you be your authentic self, good luck having a job. What if they're not authentic? What if the person is maliciously dishonest and mm -hmm. really, not was their opinions can harm the campus as a whole? Hmm. What, what, what? Like, for example, let's say a person could, like, let's say I'm just, I have an opinion. Yeah. That's, I'm, how is that? For the sake of it, it, If you have an of, evil opinion, I'm safer for knowing your evil opinion. No, it, like, for example, the war between Israel and Palestine. Yeah. Right? Let's say uh, I'm pro Israel, but, like, I'm supporting all the bad acts that one side has done, and I'm 
being dishonest and I'm be, like I'm being malicious towards the other side. Do you think that's a problem? I think right now both sides of Israel Palestine think the other side is being malicious um, and lying, and they both think the other side is acting in bad faith um, and on the side of the devil. Um, and I think that that's situation normal is that most people think the they think the people they disagree with, like I said before, are stupid or evil. And so one of the reasons why you allow freedom of speech is not necessarily that people can come to agreement, but so they can actually know what each other, uh, 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 which, uh, which, the, which the other person thinks. But the idea of kind of like who would be the judge of what opinion you're of, it makes you stupid or evil. And even if you were stupid or evil, it's valuable to know that. So yeah, I mean like freedom of speech means that you're free to express your opinion. You're, you're free to engage in devil's agus advocacy, thought experimentation. You're free to upset because you, you know what the alternative to freedom of speech is? It's violence. That's the way we usually, historically speaking, the way people settle who gets to decide is through threat of violence, actual viol violence, coercion, other things that are, uh, uh, um, and the idea that we can actually settle things through words, you shouldn't be surprised if you're replacing violence. Those words can be harsh, and those words can be scary, and those words can be nasty, but it's a lot better than, than the state of nature. But good question. All the way in back. So throughout American history, in like times of crisis, you have this like failure of freedom of speech to be maintained. Mm -hmm. Like examples like, you know, in Civil War, if I like supported the Confederacy, I was in the North, they mm -hmm. got to like arrest me, you know. And then during the that wasn't actually true. The, 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 the um, but go on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, like I don't know. there was like a handful oh, of Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs. Perfect. Yeah. That was just the. I just wanted an example, but my example was bad. Eugene Debs. Yeah, Eugene Debs. So you have these times of like track record history when you enter a crisis. Yep. Freedom of speech does fail, and you know we're lucky enough that it returns over time. Yeah. And I think like through the, through the statistics you showed, like we are entering a time not like a direct like militaristic crisis, but we are in like a cultural crisis as a whole. Yeah. And that's like a pretty common like critique of America currently. Yeah. So beyond like personally just trying to like be empathetic and compassionate, do you think there's like a way like institutionally to navigate like something like that happening, or do you think you just kind of have to wait it out as a whole? Um, I think we can't afford to wait it out. I think that the um, situation on campus is really bad. Um, not, not necessarily a sell, but like nationally, partic particularly, it's particularly bad in the most expensive colleges, which for whatever messed up reason are the most influential colleges in the country. Like I, I sometimes get people disingenuously complaining about like, oh, Harvard, why do people care so much about it? Because I think it's gross, but disproportionately, like how much of America's leadership comes from Harvard and Yale. I, 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 I find it really distasteful. I don't think it should be the, the case, but you have to worry about, uh, about these places. And I think right now they can't, you know, they're, they're, they've done a lot to make it difficult to take the kind of knowledge that they produce very seriously. So in terms of like stuff that we should be doing, I mean, I think we need to be thinking about ways to have a, a, a less bureaucracy in higher ed, because a lot of that's responsible for why you see a lot of the censorship. I think we be, should be figuring out cheaper, better ways to do education at pretty much every level that are more equitable. I think we give way too much power and privilege to some of these fancy schools um, that we shouldn't. I think we need a lot of experimentation in the education space. But, um, you know, not to, not, not to um, be too pessimistic about it, but yeah, I, I think, I think that the I think things are coming to a head to a degree, um, and I and I think I'm 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 a little worried about say the next five to ten years, um, ma'am. Um, picking back in on this question, what you just said, so a lot of our leadership is coming from these universities like Harvard and Yale. Yeah. And you talked about how the adults are mimicking these educational strategies or classroom environments that encourage censorship and. Students. Yeah. And these people are elected. They're, we've, we've already seen a trickle down from the college classroom to high school curriculum to what's available in libraries. Yeah. Like, it seems like censorship is inevitable in every walk of life. And mm -hmm. part of the reason for that is our political culture. Yeah. And if we have, if we routinely, I don't know how to phrase this, but it's like if, if people are called, coddled, go to Harvard where they're coddled. Yep in part because they're 
preferred being ousted socially or professionally. And then they had a job in government. And then they passed policies that encouraged censorship. I think we're at the end. Like, I don't know how you would. Yeah. <laughs> Is this a side of collapse? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't know how you could propose any solution. Uh, if so, Harvard? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I definitely have been pretty harsh about Harvard, and Harvard fit, finished dead last in our campus free speech ranking this year. But that's and that was all empirical. Right? Like it, it wasn't our opinion um, that they, they they finished dead last. Um, you know, like, but keep in mind, like, like, like you were saying, like that there were other moments in American history where the you know free speech has been in trouble, civil liberties have been in trouble, and usually it's at a time of crisis. Um, and I think that crises in the United States tend to come in 80 to 100 year cycles. Um, and I, I, I actually, I was always dismissive of, of cyclical, cyclical theories of, of um, societies um, until I started reading the work of Peter Turchin um, and Neil Howe. And I do think that we're kind of just about the time that they predicted back in 97 that we're going to have a societal crisis. And you don't know how that's going to end. Um, but definitely, you know, b big things can move pretty fast under those circumstances. Um, but I, I don't think the, the current educational system, the way we do it, is fair. I don't think it's equitable. I don't think it's reliable on the production of knowledge. Um, and I think that we have to think big on how we reform it. But would like the opposite of catastrophizing mm -hmm. be I've already seen, and you see this with like, yeah. demographics, people are completely Yeah, I think that when you look at the numbers of Americans, both on the left and the right, who think actually it's, you know, violence is appropriate in, re um, in response to their opponents, um, there haven't been numbers like that since the Civil War. And it's scary as all get out. Um, and I don't welcome this. I'm not happy at all about any of this stuff, but I do think that things are going to be pretty rough. Um, sorry. Not to, not to, hate, 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 hate to not be so cheery. I did. <laughs> Sir. Uh, you, uh, your co author uh, in uh, your book. Height or Ricky Schlott? Uh, Ricky Schlott. Yeah. Uh, we bring up the point of uh, students reluctant to speak up. Yeah. Would you say a few more words about that? Sure, yeah. No, so on my first co-authored book, I got to work with a, one of the most eminent uh, you know, social psychologists in the world, um, who's you know, maybe 11 years older than me. On my second co-authored book, I got to work with a then 20-year-old young woman named Ricky Schlott, um, who's brilliant, and she's 23 now. And it was really great to get to work with her, partially because so much of Coddling the American Mind was about um, mental, the mental health crisis facing young women, and having who, by, and by that we mean Gen Z, and to be able to have a Gen Z co-author was really nice. Uh, was really nice to be able to have her perspective on it. But yeah, she talks about, I mean, the cancel culture of growing up in the age of of cell phones just sounded. I, I was thinking more about the self censorship. Yeah, well, but th that's one of the reasons. I, I mean, one of the things in Abigail Schreier's uh, latest book is about how you know some young people, not saying anybody here here does this, but they'll keep um, uh, screenshots of their friends saying things that might they might be embarrassed about or might be offensive if it actually got out as a dossier, essentially, so that they could cancel them if they ever decide to come after them. And I'm like, oh, kill or be killed. That sounds just great. So yeah, it sounds like a, you know, I'm pretty glad I grew up in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> Ma'am. Do you think the increase of being admitted into mental hospitals, and teenagers being admitted into mental hospitals, do you think that's an increase in depression? Do we, due to an increase in depression, do you think that interludes with cancel culture? Yeah, I do. Um, I think that the, in, in Coddling the American Mind, we talk about how we think that the, uh, that one, we're teaching kids this exaggerated way of thinking, but I also think the environment of having the first generation to grow up with cell phones in their pocket, with social media 24 hours a day, um, it's a nasty way to grow up. And I, and I do actually think that um, a, a variety of factors combine, um, including the idea that at any moment, your friends could stab you in the back. 
you know, they're keeping a dossier on you to, just to make sure that, like, you know, in that kill or be killed situation. Um, so I, I do think that uh, social media has contributed to it, but I also think a number of other factors, including just I, in coddling, we talk about it. It's like we're, we're it's like we're teaching the kids kids reverse CBT, like how to, how to be miserable, and then we're wondering why they're so miserable. Um, <laughs> and cancel culture is like reverse CBT. Like it, 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 there's and again, it's also not very Christian. There's there's no forgiveness. There's no grace. There's no mercy. Um, and you know and yeah, the idea the idea of having sec, uh, having s secular sinners with no chance of redemption. Ugh. <laughs> Sounds awful. A good question. Uh, yeah. um, do you think that um, cancel culture should be essential into our society nowadays? Should, should be essential? Yeah. I mean, not essential, but like, do you think um, that cancel culture should be like staying in society and how it's affecting us? Um, you know, I think that, I think that we're, th th this crisis that I'm talking about, sort of like of, you know, people uh, right and left actually increasingly saying that they think there's going to be a violent response, you know, like over the next couple of years. Um, it does it doesn't bode well for the future. And I think that the it's a situation where we need as much grace and forgiveness and, uh, and, and the possibility of redemption um, as possible. And so I think that that's exactly what we, that's those are the attitudes we need. Um, but I think it's going to take something scared people, you know, sufficiently before we actually even consider that. So, so basically, like, I, I think cancel culture is a, an unkind way to live a life, and I think it's not good for anybody, really. Um, I much prefer sort of tolerance and open-mindedness. Um, I think we've got a way to go go before we get anywhere near that, though. <laughs> but the thing is, is, like, when you look at the stats, the, the generation that hates cancel culture the most um, generally, when it comes to things free speech, it's older people appreciate it the most. Um, but when it comes to cancel culture, the generation that is the most hostile to cancel culture is Gen Z. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am. Ma I thought the analogy between the inner dialogue of the mind that you talked about, like you would engage with, with the types of therapy versus the dialogue of the culture, I thought that was really interesting. How would you develop that? If you were going to design a way of facilitating a conversation or a dialogue mm -hmm. based off of, say, cognitive behavioral therapy principles, how would you organize and facilitate that dialogue? Honestly, I don't know. I, I didn't really. I, I'm working on a um, on a Coursera course about freedom of speech and how it relates to. Um, how it relates to neuroscience. Um, so that's kind of like when it, when it comes to sort of like how to actually explain that is a little bit where my head is. But like trying to, trying to actually teach people CBT in a non-therapeutic environment can lead to iatrogenics, it can, can lead to neg negative uh, outcomes from trying to help somebody. Um, because basically it ends up framing in some ways, basically it's like, oh, you're giving me therapy. There must be something really wrong with me. And it's like, no, that's exactly what I'm trying to fight. But like, so, um, and in a lot of cases, some of the best things for CBT is experience. Like, like as far as practical CBT, it's giving kids greater independence when they're younger, making sure that they actually, you know, are encouraged to take on more responsibilities. Like, I feel like in some ways, some of the best things, you know, that taught me sort of a, a, a primitive kind of CBT was having a job since I was 11. So I think, I think a lot of the, the things that actually create this environment um, where you can have these cognitive distortions is that we haven't given kids enough self-efficacy to actually develop some of these natural kind of responses on their own. <laughs> sure. What do you think is the leading cause of this cancel culture? Mm -hmm. Could it be like mal malicious intent? Mm -hmm. Could it just be simple miseducation of those a part of it? I think, I think that there's, uh, one of the things I love about being a constitutional lawyer is that in the Bill of Rights, there's a great deal of optimism about human nature and a fair amount of cynicism too. And that's appropriate because human beings are we're flawed. You know, we do have good motivations, but we also have very selfish motivations, you know, at the same time. So I think if you create an environment that doesn't that expects people to be angels, 
you're empowering every mean person and sociopath to do kind of do whatever they want. Whereas if you're assuming that people are going to be selfish, sometimes at least, you actually create an environment in which you know people can show the better, better angels of their nature and the people who actually are being nasty get punished. And I think in some ways cancel culture really thrives in environments where um, if I can act like I'm the morally superior person, everybody has to go along with me. And I think a lot of kind of the tactics for winning arguments in K through 12, you know, in, in, in grade schools, you know, rely on you presenting yourself as the morally superior person. Um, and I think it's a great way to bully somebody um, is to be kind of like, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not the bully. You're the bully, actually, in fact, and I'm going to ruin your life. Um, so I think, I, I think that some amount of selfishness is normal. It uh, doesn't have to be tolerated, it doesn't have to be commendable. So I think that some of cancel culture is very much selfishness. I do think that it's also people believing they're saving, you know, they're, they're doing something positive. But I mean, here's the thing, it's kind of like, a lot of times when, I, when you look at history, the most dangerous person in any given society is actually the person who is most certain that they are correct and most certain that they are morally righteous. And there is a quote that I've always loved, is like this true spirit of liberty is that which is not too sure that it is right. And what that means is, if you want to have a free society and you want to have a tolerant society, that little thing in your, in, in your heart that tells you that you've got this right and everyone else got this wrong, you got to sideline that a little bit. Sir. As if you agree with it, yeah. Do you think that that, like, if that in a school? Because I know you just said, like, how we're taught to, like, argument, like, we're argument of, like, um, styles in K-12, like, we're always going to be right, and it shows that we're right. Do you think that that, like, in my things, like, a high school level, like, a, at a high school, like, a senior or a junior level, like, do you think that can stunt the, like, possible like, uh, like evolution of culture? That's a great question. And actually, I do think it could help. Like if I could wave a magic wand and have every you know, high school junior in the world do a formal, you're, you're, <laughs> uh, do a, um, uh, like a, a debate, like a formal debate, but the rule is that you have to take the opposite side from what you actually believe, I think it would be very healthy because it does lead to that thing where you, you know, you, you, you don't, you no longer see the, the person you disagree with it has to be stupid or evil. And it's something that everybody has to do in law school because, and it's funny, because like um, you usually pick lots for what side of a debate you're on. And watching someone go into a debate, you know, and being like, I'm 100% on side one of, of, of this debate, and that's where I came in, but then they actually pick side two. And how quickly they start convincing themselves that side two is actually the right one and the other one's wrong. And it's like, but see, once you see yourself doing that, you realize that everybody's doing that. So I, I think it could be a really powerful, you know, um, uh, antidote to, to, to some of the evils that I'm talking about in here. Uh, Ma'am. Um, so my question is, like, how do you find any hope for this? Because um. we're at a time in human history where we have more access to knowledge than we've ever had before. And I feel like just kind of thinking is always the idea that if we just come together and if we just listen to each other and debate things, like yeah. surely there will be less violence in society and we can all come together and agree to have our differences. But that's not the reality that we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like as a kid growing up, we were always told that, oh, the internet is going to be this great thing that will bring people together. And really, we just see more partisan polarization. We see more QAnon-type conspiracies that are widely out of control. Um, and so it almost seems like the problem may not be our ability to find this info or have debates. Yeah. Because it, it almost seems like it's fruitless. Yeah, no, I wouldn't, I, 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 I'm pessimistic about, I'd say, maybe in the next five years. I'm not pessimistic for the grand s sweep of human history. Um, and it's partially because, like, like, I do think that periodically you, you, you run into a crisis. Um, and I think we're probably heading into one. 
Um, and I, you know, my, my, I can hear my COO saying, it's like, Craig, don't be so dark um, about this stuff. But I also try to always, always be honest. But one thing that I do try to sort of like, one way I am different from John Haidt um, is that John's new book, it talks a lot about sort of like trying to make it so that kids, you know, can't get cell phones, uh, can't, get on, can't get on social media. And I have a lot of sympathy for this, but I think that we're living in a moment in which there has been, so, okay, what I studied, uh, the, 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 remember I said I did six credits on censorship during the Tudor dynasty? That was all about the printing press. And it was about how when the um, when Henry VIII, you know, started not liking the Protestant Bible hitting, uh, hitting Europe back when he was a Catholic, he tried to reign in the printing press. But then when he became a Protestant, he reigned in it even more. Um, he wanted to put sort of like the printing press genie back in the bottle because he didn't like the effects it was having. And a lot of times as a First Amendment lawyer, you're supposed to be kind of like, oh yeah, and there was a moral panic and it was no big deal. It's like, no, in the short term, the printing press led to an increase in the witch trials because one of the best sellers in the world was actually the book on like how to spot a witch. Um, it led to a massive, incredibly bloody uh, couple centuries of religious war. It led to uh, a, a civil disruption as well. Like it, it, and in the short term, I don't really blame them for thinking, oh my goodness, if I could just destroy this infernal printing press, I would do that right now. And that was just introducing millions of additional people into the global conversation. That's going to be disruptive, period. We just introduced billions of people to the global conversation instantaneously. There's nothing vaguely like that in history. And so right now, everything feeling crazy is exactly the way it feels in a massive technological shift that we haven't fully reckoned with yet. Um, so I do think that it makes sense for it to be crazy right now, but that's not to assume that we're in a, some permanent state of decay, because eventually what happened with the printing press is we realized, actually, a couple million more eyes on every problem is pretty good. I actually still hold some hope that a couple billion more eyes on every problem um, is going to be uh, is going to lead to some positive things. We're just not seeing it or feeling it right now. So, um, yeah, and oh, that's it. Yeah, that would be the last question.